thanks everyone for, for being here today. So I'm Alex van der Sand. I, I am here to talk about MIST, but I do a little bit more than that on the foundation. I, I'm, the, I'm a designer for the, for the foundation and I do some other stuff like the website and I'm not sure if you ever look at the website, I suppose so, but we do have some outrageous claims on there, like build unstoppable apps, have a rob robot run your organization, or how the internet was supposed to work. Those, those are sort of outlandish claims, and a few people got a little bit mad this year that they were there, and if you're one of those people, I'm sorry, I'm kind of responsible because I wrote them, I put them there, and I'm here to explain what do we mean by that and why do we still stand for every word. So what does that mean, how the internet was supposed to work, right? In order to understand this, let's see what the problem is, right? The way that the internet works right now is that if you're building a service, you first, you put up a server and you serve a client. And if you have five clients, then your server will serve those five clients. What happens is if you have 500 or 500,000 clients, then that becomes a problem. And there are normally two things that can happen. The first one is that your server will just burn down and crash, and it will take with it a part of the internet history, your users will be abandoned, and if you were doing any sort of public good, then that will be just lost. So the second option that most people take is the funding route, right? Get some VC money, put a bunch of super servers out there, and they will reach your 500,000 users. But now, VCs are not donors, so when they give you a million dollars, they expect a billion dollars back somehow. And since we don't have any like easy currency on the, on, the, on the internet right now, the easiest, most accessible currency are eyeballs. And also, by the way, we have all that private information already on our servers, so let's just sell everything to advertisers. And that's how we get where we are today, right? Because all your users are just products that you're selling to s your shareholders and your advertisers. And it gets even weirder when you start seeing the division of labor. Because those big pink guys, they are there to serve you content, they keep the, your private data, they connect the users, they solve any sort of conflicts. And the other guys here, they just show you your stuff. Which is crazy because the computer you have on your pocket right now is probably a thousand or a million times more powerful than the most powerful server when the web was created. And I'm, I'm talking just about one device you have in your pocket. Just imagine all the devices that you have uh, that are connected to you. And it becomes even worse when you start thinking about the ecosystem. Because every one of those guys are separate islands. They are silos. And if, you're, if you build your reputation on Airbnb, then that reputation is locked to by Airbnb. You cannot take it elsewhere unless Airbnb wants it. And if Facebook and YouTube doesn't want to, to work together, they won't. If it do doesn't make sense for them to work together, they won't. So that's, that's, how, that's the problem we see on the internet right now. And the way Ethereum really tries to solve it is to distrib distribute all the tasks, right? So files are served by anyone in Swarm, and your apps are all, and uh, all the apps that reach con the need consensus are just run on every one of the, no of the full nodes. And that's how we got Ethereum where we are today. And we launched this at DevCon Zero with just like, uh, with just console, which is just very devel developer oriented. It's like the DOS era. So before, before the US came along, whenever you wanted to build a new software, you had also to build a new computer. And the DOS came along, and then now, as a developer, you can build software for all computers. The same thing with the Ethereum tools, where now, as a developer, you can build blockchain apps just for all, uh, you, don't, you don't need to build your own blockchain for that. 
but there's no graphic interface, it requires the phone download. And then in DevCon 1, last year, we were talking and we launched the Jiren Wallet. And I think it's a great tool, it's an advanced tool for specialists, and I like to think it of more like physical, correct, cell. Also, taking the personal computer example, Back then, if you were an accountant, if you wanted to do spreadsheets, you would take Excel or VisiCalc, and you didn't need to be a developer anymore, but you still needed to be someone who wanted to use specialized software. Because what the wallet does is that it builds dynamic interfaces for the contracts that you want to interact with, but still requires a full blockchain and requires you to have Ether in order to use it. And that's how we get to MIST here at DEVCON 2. It's meant for the enthusiast users, and by that I want you to think Netscape Navigator or Firefox, in the sense that when they came, they weren't for everyone, but they really were, they really helped broaden the horizons of the types of users that were using the web back then. And the idea is that we bring the full power of web interfaces into smart contracts, or you could say vice versa. And it has a light client, uh, so it doesn't, it won't require a full blockchain download, and we are doing some creative ways of funding. So let's look at how it looks, right? So right here in the corner, we have the, I, I launched a light client. Right here, we have Mist being launched. And this is a, this is a recording, unedited. And what you can see there is I'm, it, it's connecting for the, uh, for the first time, so you choose the main network, or you, can, you can download your pre-sale wallet, and then you create your password. So MIST will take you to the steps necessary to create your account. And once you create your account, it will generate an ident icon to you, and you can start also funding it. You can fund it with Bitcoin or, or any sort of other cryptocurrency, and we are working with Coinbase. At some point, you'll be able to fund it with a, with a credit card, and all you need to do is deposit. And all, meanwhile, while you're doing this, it's already downloading. It's downlo downloading already more than half of the whole chain. And if you still if it's still not enough, we can like offer you a, a little bit of reading material so you can try to understand more about Ethereum on the meantime. So for example, we can, let's learn about how to build a democracy on the blockchain. That's, I love this phrase over there, which is on the blockchain, no one knows you are fridge. But uh, we don't have time to read this. We, I'm not going to talk about DAOs right now or democracy on the blockchains. So you close it and it's there, it's launched. It has already synced. So in less than one minute and 30 seconds, and of course it will depend on some other factors, we were able to sync from scratch in a clean machine and you can start using Ethereum right now. And that's the main net. And I want now to switch to the test net to show you some other very cool stuff, right? So this is the Ethereum wallet. I think most of you have used it at some point. It's really meant to help you use smart contracts so I created uh, a smart contract that, that is called Donut Coins, which is just, just a token that you send around, and I want to send five Donut Coins to a friend. Now, here's something cool, right? Because right now, Ethereum has the to address, the from address, and a few information like bytecode, and that doesn't really communicate anything to the user. What we are doing right now is that we are able to decode whatever that bytecode means and show the user exactly what's what the transaction he's about to do is supposed to do at least. So it's a transfer function, it's going to transfer to that green guy on the bottom and it's going to transfer five, five what? Five donuts coins, those are the parameters. And of course, if you want to check the, the contract, you can always click on the top to, to check I the actual source code of the contract, but you're not doing that right now. So all we need to do is you just check if the parameters are right, type your password and you're gone. And I think that's a great way of already of, of interfacing with smart contracts. But here's the nice trick. All this wallet we've built, it's built in pure HTML and CSS, and anyone should be able to create another wallet with a, such a rich interface as this. And that's what we want Miss to do. So in the left here, we have a browser button where you can just browse to any app you want, and it will and we have so, so many apps already and more are being built. And you could just type, a, type any address on the top. But here, you cannot really see it, but in the top, I'm not pasting an address, I'm pasting a hash. So what does the hash mean? A hash is not a location where you find an application. 
a hash really describes a specific version of a, an application. It's a bunch of files, a specific version of a bunch of images, a bunch of HTML, a bunch of JavaScript. And when you paste a hash there, what it does, it's connecting you to Swarm. And that's also a recording of a live prototype, and you can see BZZ up there. And what it's, it's doing is that it's just downloaded this whole interface from Swarm, meaning that it's now running on your local machine. And now, since it's running on a local machine, it doesn't necessarily know about you. And then the first thing you have to do is kind of authenticate yourself. But instead of the apps requiring mm, to have uh, every app you go, you have to create a username and a password, and that's dependent on the, the uh, central server that can be hacked. Instead, MIST provides you with a few accounts that you can just choose. So I want to identify myself to this voting app with that second account over there. And once you authorize it, your app can kind of change the interface to reflect that now it knows that you are this given account. And now I created this little app. It's just a voting, a stake voting thing. You can just, you put a parameter there, like you say something, let's say Game of Thrones is better than Star Wars. And anyone can vote to agree or disagree, and their vote will be counted in stake voting. And here's, here's the magic, right? I created all this whole interface and the whole purpose of it was just to get to this point where I create you a transaction. And once you create that transaction, now the user is back in control because the user can see all the parameters. He can see that he's about to do a vote application. He's uh, doing a vote on that, on that account on the top. And he is using a f the first parameter is a hash of whatever he said. The first is just a yes or no, meaning he agrees or disagrees. And in order to and in order to vote, all he needs to do is type his password. So he's back in control. So think about this, right? I just run this whole app, and it runs completely without servers. Because all the files you need to run them are were downloaded via Swarm from a peer-to-peer -peer network, and that are like locally on your machine. All your private information, your login, your account information is kept by you, by your computer that is safe. And finally, all the information that you need to be public, to be common, to be synchronized is kept on the blockchain. And you can see that, well, it seems that everyone agrees with me. And, and I think that's, that's the kind of architecture that we want to move moving forward all depths to think about. An architecture where all the private information is kept and managed by the user himself, and there is no central server that anyone that goes to that particular DAP will always find this exact version of the application. And what are the next steps that we want? So the next step here is, first of all, hashes are terrible way, terrible user interfaces because they are long, they are not human friendly, and they are not updatable. So you can just replace them for the ENS system that Nick was talking yesterday. Also, we have uh, Solidity now has authenticated contracts, which allow some nice things with Swarm. And right now, the way we are doing this decoding thing is that we just download a bunch of signatures with Myth when you download Myth, and if you, it's not enough, you can ping a central server. But with authenticated contracts, what you can do is that we can, once you interact with a contract, we can download both the source code and the ABI directly from Swarm and show you exactly what it's about to do. Another very cool thing that we are working on is easier installers. We already have a DMGs, we already, already have Windows installers on the la latest releases. We are, we are starting to do signing, signing with PGPs, and we want to do a full app signing so we can eventually be on app stores too. And there's another interesting thing is that right now, I think most people underestimate how much how users come into the ecosystem affects how users think. Because everyone who has to come into the, in to the ecosystem has to have bought Ether in an exchange at some point. So a lot of users are get in with this trading ideal. And back in the beginning, we could allow mining where anyone could just use their computers to get Ether, that's pa long past gone. But what Swarm allows us to do is that by just sharing your internet connection, you could get a little bit of Ether. If you have a file that just suddenly becomes popular because everyone is using that application, you will be paid a tiny amount of Ethers, which is not a big amount, but enough so you can start playing around with smart contracts without having to buy in an, in an exchange. 
Another thing we are excited to be working on is swappable backends. Geth is a great node, but uh, I mean there are some other people doing some very nice work. And Parity basically saved our asses this this be in the beginning of this week. So we are trying to work with every uh, with the other developers to see what do we need to make swappable backends where the user can just select another node and uh, it would download it live and it just a single file would have all the configuration necessary to work to for uh, for MIS to work with any uh, any backend that you want. Now, another things we have on the roadmap, right? And we have tons of things that we want to talk about. We don't have time for them, but uh, so first of all, Ethereum RC67 is a very cool is a very cool thing I want to work with. It is the idea to create a single link that you can it, it will definitely make creating smart contracts a lot easier because instead of having to download a JavaScript li library and creating a transaction out of JavaScript, you could create a new transaction by just clicking on it. So you would click on it, it would the, the link would come with a URI saying the, the whose address is it's going to, wha what are the parameters, and then, and then just by having static files with a fixed link, anyone could create a file a link that you would open miss with the right way to do a transaction. Invitation files. We saw on the beginning that the first thing you do on the wallet is download your pre-sale wallet. Of course, fewer and fewer people still have pre-sale wallets, but what if you could use that same mechanism to create some sort of invitation system where I can create a new, a tiny little, little wallet with a small amount of Ether and give to a friend that will for, from his point of view, it just looks like an invitation file that allows him to be a part of Ethereum. He drags it, and then it already has it ar already has some some parameters, some functions, and things that allow him to to connect your back to your friends. We want to work with the deterministic and paper wallets, and we are moving the account management from the node to the client. It has two big advantages. One of them, it makes the node swappable backends easier because now you, your node only needs to, to be able to sync with the blockchain. It doesn't need to actually do the account management and the user doesn't need to, to have new accounts for every node they, they want. It's easier for them to switch and also allows us to do more extensible things like at some point allowing you to do anything you want to do with, a con with an account you could do with a contract. Let's say you could do with a multisig or you could do with a scheduler contract or anything like that. And there's another thing and, and the reason I chose that picture is it's, it's something I want to leave you guys with. It's, I come from Brazil, and in Brazil there's literally nothing that's five more than 500 years old, and mostly not, nothing that's more than 200 years old. But here it's different. In China and in Europe, we, you still can find roads that are thousands of years old. Those are roads that were built by empires that have long been gone and that after those empires, other kingdoms have come and gone, and the roads are still there, and the roads are still usable. And they are not usable because they were magical or they, they are built very well in the beginning. They are still usable today because those people that came after the original purpose of the road was gone, those people could just do their own road ma maintenance. Now, railroads are not like that. You can find railroads that are 30 years old that because uh, a single company has gone bankrupt or because a government just lost interest on that, it just lies there abandoned and nobody else can do it, can, can keep using it. So let's try to build the internet like we build roads, not railroads. Well, think of Twitter, think of WeChat, think of all those apps that we use every day that make a big difference. They can all simply go away tomorrow if there's they are blocked by a government or if their board makes a bad de decision that go takes the app in a different direction than the community is. Let's try to build apps that allow that allow that just like roads will allow anyone who is the community that wants to take that allows the app to keep be alive and keep running long after the original purpose and the original creators of them are gone. Apps that other communities can take over, can control, and can take forward. Apps that are truly unstoppable and are truly 
there for a long time and there for, for the long term. And I would really like to thank my whole team for all the good work that they've, they've been doing and a lot of other people that are not directly part of my team but are also a very important step into having this where it is today. Thank you. <laughs>